Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Cary Grant and Phyllis Thaxter in I Confess. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings in Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play, I confess, has one of the most unusual plots for sustained interest and suspense I have ever seen. And of course, when that master director, Alfred Hitchcock, adds his individual touch to the action, it's bound to be another screen hit for Warner Brothers. And for our stars, we have one of the finest actresses on the screen, Phyllis Thaxter, co-starring with Cary Grant, who will again prove his great versatility in a highly dramatic role. You know, there's no soap quite like mild and gentle Lux. Lux toilet soap has been a Hollywood custom for years. Once our glamorous Hollywood stars start using Lux, they won't use any other soap. And once you start using it, you'll know why nine out of ten screen stars depend on Lux soap for their complexion care. Now, I confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. Night, the venerable city of Quebec. In the moonlight, the narrow cobble-side streets are all but deserted. A man, wearing the cassock of a priest, has darted into the rectory of a church. He sheds the cassock, and now he enters the church itself. Who is it? Who's there? It's Father Logan. Oh, Father Logan. I did not recognize you in the dark. Is that you, Keller? Yes, Father. And what are you doing here this time of night? I, I came in to pray. Is something wrong? Can I help you? No one can help me. I have abused your kindness. How? You who gave my wife and me a home here, right with the church, a job, even friendship, to me a refugee, a German. Now you will hate me. Oh, no, I don't hate anyone, Keller. You will, you will hate me. But it was for her, for my wife. She worked so hard, Father, it breaks my heart. Keller, what is it? I must confess to you. I want to make a confession. All right, we'll go to the confessional. Yes, yes. I want you to hear my confession. So, you've been to the house of Mr. Villette. Go on, Keller. Yes, Villette the lawyer. I killed Mr. Villette. Keller. I went to steal his money. I wore a cassock. If anyone saw me, they would think I was a priest. I was looking for the money when Villette surprised me. I did not mean to kill him. You must believe me, Father. I did not mean to kill him. <laughs> No, you didn't do it. Otto, you did not kill him. I have just come from confession. Oh. Father Logan is my priest. You are my wife. It is right that you should also know. But why, Otto? Why? I am not a murderer. It was an accident. It was the money. How could I watch you work so hard? I lie awake night after night, and I think all we need is $2,000, Alma. With $2,000, we can start a new life. And Villette was rich. Oh, oh, it's so dangerous. They will catch me. They will hang me. I cannot. I cannot. Father Logan will go to them. He will tell them. He will tell them? No, he cannot tell them what he heard in confession. The police will come. Why, Alma? Why should they come? I have told them nothing, have I? Alma, no one knows. Father Logan knows. But he cannot tell them what he heard in the confessional. Can't you understand that? What are you going to do? Nothing. Nothing at all. In the morning, you are going to the police? Tomorrow is Wednesday, Alma. Isn't that the day when I attend to Mr. Villette's garden? But he is dead. I always work in Mr. Villette's garden on Wednesdays. <gasps> Tomorrow is Wednesday. Now go to bed. You need to rest. Rest, I rest. Can I 
hope your father were trying to keep this crowd away from the house. You are the police? Yes. You've heard, haven't you, Mr. Vallette's been murdered? Yes, I had an appointment here this morning. With Vallette? Yes. Is, uh, is there anything I can do? Well, if you had an appointment, you better go in the house. Uh, do you mind? Not at all. Inspector LaRue's in there. Maybe he'd like to talk to you. This way. Father Michael Logan, huh? What church, Father? The Church of Saint Marie, Inspector. Well, how are Father Millet and Father Benoit? They're both very well, thank you. Good. So you had an appointment with Vallette? Yes. Anything special? No, there was something he... You've heard what's happened, of course, Father. Oh, we've got Keller in the next room. Keller? He works at the rectory, doesn't he? Uh, yes, he and his wife work there. Poor devil's terrified. I've been waiting for him to settle down. I see. It was Keller who found the body. You don't mind if we call on you later? No, I'll be at the church. Maybe that we'd like to know what your appointment was all about, eh? Well, I'd better see Keller now. Yes, well, goodbye, Inspector. All right, Murphy, bring him in, will you please? <laughs> told policemen. I have told them everything. Now, there's no need to be frightened, Keller. Now, how did you find the body? This morning, I arrived as usual at half past eight. I came inside. You have a key to this house? No, the door was open. It frightened me. An open door? Why? The door was always locked. I went in and there he was. I could see that he was dead. I wanted to run. Run? You do not understand. How can you? There I was, a man without a country, alone, discovering a murder. I thought of the police. I am always afraid of the police. This is a German fear, this fear. There's nothing to be afraid of here. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Father Logan is here. I heard them say that Father Logan... Well, he was here. He's gone now. What will he think of me? Probably very highly, if you can be of more help to us. Help? There are a few things I'd like to know. Now, when you first came into the house, did you call for Mr. Vallette, or...? Father Logan. Please, we can't talk here. But is it true? It's true, Ruth. Vallette's been murdered. I can't believe it. Michael, we're free. We're free. Are we? Goodbye, Ruth. Father Logan? Come in, Keller. The police, they sent me home. I must talk to you, Father. Why? Why did you come to Villette's house? I know what you must think of me, but I can't give myself up. They would hang me. Has not God forgiven me thanks to you? But the police never would. I don't know what you're talking about. I confess to you. It was my confession. You must tell me what to do. There... There's nothing I can add to what I've already said. You are so good, Father. It's easy for you to be good. Have you no pity for me? Otto? Alma? Father Benoit, he asks, will you please mend the tire on his bicycle? Yes, yes, right away. The front tire, he left it at the back door. Please, Father. You, you'd better go now and fix the tire. <laughs> it, Mr. Robertson. I said to myself, you're in no position to go to the Crown Prosecutor. You've got nothing to give him. But I'm here just the same, Mr. Robertson. Oh, you're quite a man, Inspector. Quite a man. Now, we know that Vallette was murdered, strangled, and that robbery may have been the motive. But we're not certain. And no fingerprints and no suspects. Oh, this should be very simple for you, LaRue. I uh, took the liberty of bringing a girl along. A girl? School girl. Oh. Murphy's got her out there in the hall. Just a possibility, Mr. Robertson. All right, LaRue. Let's hear what she's got to say. Thank you, sir. So, you are Augustine. Yes, monsieur. Sorry you had to be dragged out from school, young lady. Oh, but I like to be dragged out from school, monsieur. Well, this is Mr. Robertson. He's the Crown Prosecutor. Now, your mother called to say that you passed the Vallette house last night. That's right. And what time was that? Eleven o'clock. A little after eleven. I was babysitting for M Madame Germain, and I left her house at 11 o'clock. Well, uh, shall we say the time was between 11 and 11.30? Yes. 
And I saw someone leaving Monsieur Villette's house. A man. A priest, Monsieur. What? A priest. Augustine, this is very important. Are you sure? Quite sure, Monsieur. I was walking by the Rue Valentin, and then suddenly there was this priest. He was coming out of the house and walking away. Did you see his face? No. How tall was he? Well, like, like you, Monsieur. And was he fat or thin? Not fat, but not thin either. Did you notice anything special about him, anything at all? No. Did he see you, Augustine? I don't think so, monsieur. But you are absolutely sure he was a priest? Yes. Thank you. You may go now. Oh, uh, I must ask you a favor. I don't want you to say anything to anyone about this. Promise? Oh, yes, monsieur. Goodbye. Goodbye, little one. And if you should need me again... Yes? It would be very nice if you could drag me out of school. You know what this means. We'll have to check every rectory in town, find out which priests were out late last night. Uh, it's ridiculous to think a priest would be involved. LaRue, you don't really think it could be a priest? Yes, maybe. There was a priest this morning who... Well? Nothing. I'll have to check further. Well, don't be so mysterious. Well, I should know something more by tomorrow. Good day, Mr. Robertson, and thank you. Inspector. Evening, Keller. Father Logan, do you suppose I could see him? Father Logan? Mm. Oh, sit down, please. I'll see if I can find him. Thank you. Who was it, Otto? Who at the door? A man. A man oh. to see Father Logan. They drove away in the man's car. Oh. Alma, have you washed the cassock? N not yet. Where is it? Upstairs in our room. Do not wash it. I do not want it washed. But why? Listen to me. There is something you must never forget. When I... I suppose we might have had this little talk at the rectory, Father. Hope you don't mind coming here to my office. Not at all. As long as Father Millet knows where I am. You told him? Yes. Unpleasant bit of business, isn't it, Father? If there's anything I can do... Well, I... just a few questions. Now, how long have you been at St. Marie's? Nearly three years. <laughs> you know, I guess I've known Father Millet for 25 years. I was a choir boy when he was over at the Basilica. Yes, he told me tonight what a fine voice you had. <laughs> He's just forgotten, that's all. I uh, hear you were in the Army. Yes. Got the Military Cross, hmm? Yes. You seem to have done a number of brave things. Well, I survived. Are you given to understatement, Father? Well, that depends. Now, this case, this Vallette murder, it's all understatement so far. You knew Vallette, right? Yes, slightly. Well, then maybe you can help me. What was he like, Father? No, I didn't know him well. Well, did you know him socially or in a business sort of way? Actually, neither. I met him once many years ago. Hmm. Cigarette? Uh, thank you, no. It's a funny thing. No one seems to have known this Villette, really known him. Yet he was a lawyer, had clients. Not one of them has any information that means anything. May I ask what you were going to see him about yesterday morning? Well, that, uh, that was a personal matter. Well, were you acting for someone, Father? One of your parishioners, perhaps? Uh, I can only tell you that my visit had nothing to do with Villette's death. Oh, of course it didn't. But you do understand, don't you, that I must consider every scrap of information. Yes. When a crime's been committed, each scrap of information is important to us. Of course. I know sometimes it seems like, well, like prying. It can be very embarrassing. Oh, I'm not embarrassed, Inspector. Good. Well, I've been wondering about that lady you met outside Vallette's house. She was in that crowd out there. I just happened to glance out the window when I saw you talking to her. Inspector, the appointment I had with Vallette could not be of any importance to you. Oh, but well, we're not discussing that at the moment, Father. You see, with a murder, one has to jump from one detail to another. Forgive me, I guess I jumped too abruptly for you. <laughs> well, perhaps I just don't follow as fast as you jump. <laughs> I'm sorry. See, I have a methodical mind. I have to take things one by one. Well, about this lady you met out there on the sidewalk. I wish I could discuss it, but I can't. May I ask who she is? 
She isn't involved. Excuse me, Father, but that's something for me to decide. I know, I know. But you'll have to take my word for it. She's not involved. Your word. I respect your word, but I need help. I'm not able to help. I see. I just don't want all this mystification to make things too awkward for you, Father. Awkward for me? A priest was seen leaving Vallette's house at the time of the murder. I saw a priest outside Vallette's house the next morning. Well, Father? Well? Too much mystification might lead one to believe that both priests were one and the same, mightn't it? What do you have to say? What would you want me to say? That's up to you. Well, then, I'd say that a man of intelligence would not be led to believe anything on so little evidence. You're perfectly right. We've checked on every priest in Quebec. Each can account for his movements at the time of the murder. That is, each, except one. Where were you at 11 o'clock, Father? I was walking. Alone? No. Good. Now, if you'll just give me the name and address of the person... I can't. Father, don't you want to help me? I've done my best. But you refuse to answer my questions. I know, I know, and I'm sorry, but it isn't possible for me to answer them. It's a pity. A great pity. But I thank you for coming, Father. Good night. Good night, Inspector. This is LaRue. Get me Mr. Robertson. Yes, yes, the Crown Prosecutor. Try his house. If he isn't home, find out where he is. I've got to talk to him. Before we continue with Act Two of I Confess, here's Francis Scully, our Hollywood reporter. What are you reading, Francis? Well, I've got a batch of reviews on the world premiere of The Robe, Ken. 20th Century Fox held it in New York last Wednesday night. 6,500 people were invited and 6,000 more gathered outside the theater. Mm, imagine what Hollywood Boulevard will be like this Thursday night at the Hollywood premiere. How were the reviews, Francis? Oh, just listen to this, Ken. The New York Daily News gave The Robe four stars and four stars for CinemaScope. The first time in its history any picture received this rating. And uh, what else did they say about CinemaScope? Well, it's considered the greatest motion picture advance in sound. Mm. How big is that CinemaScope screen again, Francis? Well, it's 65 feet long and 24 feet high. And it's so wide that a chariot has four white horses, not just two, thundering toward the audience. Not to mention close-ups of Richard Burton, Gene Simmons, and Victor Mature all at once. <laughs> I love this description of Victor Mature. They write that Victor plays the Greek slave, quote, with the controlled arrogance of a trained leopard, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> leopard, eh? Hey? And Gene Simmons? Oh, these are the words they use about her. Lovely and passionate. I could add a few words about Jean myself, such as complexion by Lux. And don't forget, Ken, the robe is in technicolor, so audiences will really see what Lux care can mean to a complexion. Well, Jean has been devoted to Lux for many years. I guess it's a habit she picked up in England. Well, Lux seems to be an international custom with most movie actresses. With so many pictures being made on location, Mexico, Rome, the Belgian Congo, why, well, I think you can call Lux the most traveled of all soaps. Yes, Lux gets around all right. Like Jean Simmons, so many stars feel that Lux is the one soap they can depend on to keep their skin looking its very best. Lux is so gentle and mild. And another nice thing, the fragrance of Lux never interferes with any perfume you wear. Thank you, Francis. Once you've used Lux, we think you'll agree with Gene Simmons and nine out of ten screen stars, there's no soap quite like Lux. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of I Confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. It's a few moments later. Mr. Robertson, the Crown Prosecutor, is not at home. But Inspector LaRue has found him. He's been a guest tonight in the home of some old friends, Pierre Granfort and his wife, Ruth. Sorry, Ruth. Looks like I've got to say good night. That phone call just now, it's about that Villette murder. You don't look so unhappy, Willie. Well, there's a very unpleasant angle. A priest is under suspicion. 
What nonsense. Well, he was seen leaving Villette's house. Which priest? Do they know his name? Inspector LaRue thinks it's a Father Logan from St. Marie's. All right, hate to leave. Thanks for a lovely dinner. Good night, Willie. Oh, no, no, don't come to the door. See you soon, Pierre. Stop worrying. It's ridiculous. Why on earth would Father Logan... Shut up. Oh, please, shut up. I'm sorry. You're still in love with him. Am I? You never spoke about it. And I'm not going to speak about it now. But you are going to speak about it. I'm not going on like this. Do whatever you wish. It's very simple, isn't it? What does one do when his wife's in love with a priest? You can leave me. How easily you can say that. I'm not in love with you. I have never been in love with you. You know that. I never wanted to believe it. That's not my fault. I've never pretended anything with you. I hope he's in trouble. Terrible trouble. Oh, my God. My God. Hello? Samurai's rectory? I want to speak to Father Logan, please. Father Logan? Oh, but he is asleep. I'm not asleep, Mrs. Keller. Oh, oh it is very late. I'll take it. Thank you. Good night, Father. Hello? Michael, I've got to see you. Uh, Ruth, please. That's impossible. I've got to see you tomorrow morning. I've got to meet you somewhere. Michael, aren't you listening? Uh, I hear you. I'm going to Levis tomorrow morning. The ferry, Michael. The nine o'clock ferry. All right. Good night. Well, good morning. <laughs> good morning, Father Logan. Walk over here. We shouldn't be seen together for your sake. I had to see you. Ruth, the police have been questioning me. They saw the two of us talking outside of Villette's house. They're trying to find out who you are. I don't care. I've got to tell you, you're being suspected. I know that. The only thing is for me to tell them that you were with me that night. You can't. They want to know why. I'll tell them everything if I have to. You've got to think of yourself. You've got to think of your husband. Think of him before I think of you. I've never been able to do that. You must. It's too late to think of him. I'm not that good. I love you. I've always been in love with you. I know, I know it's wrong, but I can't help it. Do you want me to lie to you? No, I don't want you to lie to yourself. I haven't changed, Michael. I've been married seven years, and I haven't changed. But I've changed, and you must understand. I'm a priest. I chose to be what I am. I believe in what I am. Michael. Ruth, I... I want you to see things as they are and not go on hurting yourself. Don't pity me. Our meeting like this is wrong. It's all wrong. It won't happen again. I won't bother you again. Goodbye. Ruth. Ruth, who was it? Who just telephoned? Willie Robertson. He wants me to come to his office. Now. Why? I was seen on the ferry this morning with Michael Logan. Apparently, I was being followed by a detective. Would you like to tell me what you're going to do? Answer whatever questions they ask me. I, I'm going to tell them why Michael could not have killed Valette. Oh. Has Father Logan cleared himself to your satisfaction? He didn't have to. I was with him at the time. Would you like me to go with you? I'm in no position to ask favors, am I? Get ready. I'll get the car. Thank you. Ruth, Pierre, I I'm so terribly sorry about all this. Oh, this is Inspector LaRue. Good evening. Inspector LaRue has promised to keep all this from the press. That is, I'll, I'll do my best. Oh, please, won't you sit down? Thank you. Father Logan is here. Here? Yes, the other room. If you'll join us, Father, please. Good evening, Father Logan. Good evening. Good evening, Father Logan. May we begin, please? What is it you want to know? Madame, you met Father Logan on the ferry this morning. Yes. May I ask the reason for this meeting? I don't think the reason could help you, Inspector. You also met Father Logan on the morning following Vallette's murder in front of the house. Yes. And the reason for this meeting? 
I had an appointment with Monsieur Vallette. But Father Logan, knowing of the murder, stopped you from entering the house. Am I right? Yes. Of course, Father did not know you had an appointment. But he did know. The night before, I'd met Father Logan. I told him I was going to see Vallette at half past nine the following morning. Madame, just so I don't misunderstand, you met Father Logan on the night that Vallette was murdered? Yes. Where? We took a drive in my car. At what time, please? Between 9 and 11. Are you sure of the time, madame? Yes, I, I came home just after 11. My husband had come in just five minutes before. That's correct, Inspector. You, uh, you told your husband that you'd just seen Father Logan? No, I, I did not tell my husband. Inspector, I beg you, must your questions be so personal? Madame, do you understand why I must ask these questions? Yes. And I came here to tell you that Father Logan could not have been involved in Monsieur Vallette's death because I was with him at the time. I accept everything you have said, madame. But I must know the reason for your appointment with Vallette. Vallette was blackmailing me. He... he was what? I met Father Logan to ask his advice. But your husband? You had not told your husband about this? No, no, it was nothing to do with my husband. You turned to Father Logan for advice, but not to your husband? Father Logan is an old friend. Then he knew that you were being blackmailed. How could he? I hadn't seen him in years. But you just called him an old friend. Inspector LaRue. Yes, just a moment, LaRue. My wife is not under oath. She doesn't have to answer these questions. Monsieur, I have only one more question. Why were you being blackmailed, madame? You needn't answer that. Why shouldn't she? Ruth, it isn't necessary. Don't answer. Madame, are you trying to protect Father Logan? From what? He hasn't done anything. It would seem as if he had. You don't care whom I hurt, do you? Just as long as I answer your questions. Madame, a man has been murdered. Ruth, if you, if you think you'd like the advice of a lawyer... Thanks, Willie. I don't think that will be necessary. The blackmail was about me and Father Logan, Inspector. You were aware of this, Father? Yes. If you will continue, Madame. I'll have to go back a long time. To the beginning of the war. It was long before Michael had entered the church. He was working then for the government. And we... We'd fallen in love. He was one of the first to volunteer. I, I hated him for that. I was selfish even then. He took things so seriously. War and love. Yes, even love. I begged him to marry me before he left. But he wouldn't. It seemed so long ago... Ruth, how can you talk of our getting married? You know I'll be shipping out soon. Oh, but darling, that's why I want to marry you. Oh, aren't there enough widows as it is? Michael. You think I don't love you enough. I love you too much. Much too much. Don't you see? There's just no telling when I'll get back. Or uh, if I ever will. Meanwhile, you'd better forget about me. How can you say that if you love me? Ah, uh, if I love you. There never can be anyone else, never. Ruth, won't you understand? It's so unfair to you. You think it's fair to tell me to forget you? <laughs> you know something? You're a very stubborn girl, aren't you? His letters were long at first, but after a while there were no letters at all. Nothing, not a word, for over a year. Meanwhile, I'd started working for my future husband. Pierre was... he was... Ruth, you don't have to tell them. You don't have to tell them anything more. I want to. You were very kind to me, Pierre. You realized I was unhappy. And like all kind people, you never asked me why. I was in love with you. Anyway, six months later, we were married. When the war was over, Michael came home. I was at the dock the day the boat arrived... We arranged to meet the following afternoon. It was a lovely day, the end of the summer. We took the ferry and went over to the island. We started to walk, and Michael told me the thoughts that had come to him during the war. The war had changed him. Then suddenly a storm came. Well, this won't do at all, will it? You don't even have a jacket. Oh, what's a little rain? Come on, let's run for it. There must be some place we can go. Where are we, anyway? Oh, I don't know. It was a beautiful meadow a minute ago. Oh, you're getting soaked. 
Oh, look, there's a house across the field. Maybe they'll let us stay there. The house was closed, Inspector. Locked. The storm grew worse. There was a summer house in the garden, a roof and lattice and ivy. It was the only shelter we could find. Sometime during the night, the rain stopped. It was sunlight that awakened me. Michael was seated at a table, his head on his arms. He, he was still asleep. And then a man came walking through the garden. Hello. Well, I've been entertaining guests, I see. He called again and Michael wakened. What a charming rendezvous. I trust you and the lady were not disturbed during the night. But what a compromising situation, monsieur. Michael, no, don't. He, he only defends your honor, madame. Get out. Get out? From my own garden? That doesn't give you the right to insult madame me. Madame Granfort? Oh, yes, I know, madame. Ruth? That is, I know of her husband, the distinguished member of Parliament. I've seen you quite often, madame, waiting for him in your car. Oh, how exciting it must be to be young. Young and beautiful. This man, Villette? Villette. What could I say to Michael? I hadn't told him I was married. Father? Let her continue. I didn't see Michael again for five years, nor Villette either. Not till the day that Michael was ordained a priest. Follette attended the ceremonies. And after that, I started to run into him all the time. One day as I left the house, he was waiting for me on the sidewalk. And those are the facts, Madame Granfort. If I don't act quickly, there'll be a terrible tax scandal. Only your husband can help me. Then go to my husband. There's nothing I can do. But your husband is so righteous, madame. You, uh, you could persuade him to use his influence, couldn't you? You can't be serious. Madame, must I tell your husband about you and Father Logan? Must I? There's nothing you can tell him. We did nothing wrong. Think it over. I'll give you 24 hours. I was helpless, frantic. If Follette started to talk, Pierre's career in politics would be finished. Michael might be unfrocked. I thought that maybe Michael might help. I telephoned him at the rectory. We met that night, and as we drove around the city, I told him what had happened. I want you to take me back to the rectory, Ruth, and uh, then I want you to go home. What are you going to do? Leave Follette to me. I'll talk to him. Can you, uh, can you meet me in front of his house tomorrow morning, say, at uh, 9.30? Yes, yes, of course. It'll be all right, Ruth. Villette will listen to reason. Don't worry about it anymore. So that explains your appointment with Villette. Yes, I see. I arrived at 9.30. I couldn't understand why the crowd had gathered. Then I saw Michael, and he told me Villette was dead. I couldn't believe it. I was free. The rest you know. Some of it, anyway. Inspector, may my wife leave now? Certainly. Father Logan has his alibi now, doesn't he, Willie? Of course. Thank you. Ruth, come. Good night. Thank Good you, night, madame, Ruth. for your help tonight. Yeah, Willie. Would you like to go now, Father? I said, would you like to go now? Hmm? Uh, go? It's been a terrible ordeal. We're very grateful. Yes. Well, good night. Well, it's over, Inspector. Is it, sir? I'd like you to see this report. What report? Dr. Bonard, the autopsy surgeon. He claims that Vallette could not have died before 11.30. Oh, wait Madame a moment. Madame Granfort said that she left Father Logan at 11. You can do a lot of things in 30 minutes. I had never quite understood why Father Logan should have killed Vallette. But now I think I can understand. And I thought it was over. I'm afraid not, Mr. Robertson. Only beginning. (laughs) 
We'll continue with Act Three of I Confess in just a few moments. Now we're going to meet lovely Joan Weldon, who was signed by Warner Brothers while singing in Song of Norway. What singing haven't you been doing lately, Joan? I mean, so this is love, Mr. Cummings, but I don't sing. I'm actually more interested in becoming a dramatic actress like Barbara Stanwyck. You don't come any better than Barbara. I saw her in the new Milton Sperling production, Blowing Wild, at the studio recently. Gary Cooper, Ruth Roman, and Anthony Quinn are stars in it, too. It was shot in Mexico, mostly near Cuenavaca, and the cast lived in one at one of those old, established world places. Built in 1527 by Cortez, the Spanish conqueror. Sounds like the picture Blowing Wild would have some wonderful scenery in it. Oh, it has, Mr. Cummings. And a very exciting story involving oil fields and armed bandits. Judging by the looks of Miss Stanwyck at the end of the picture, well, I hope she had Lux toilet soap along with her. Why is that, Joan? Miss Stanwyck was covered with oil and debris. She plays the part of an unscrupulous woman infatuated with Gary Cooper. And I guess you'd say she gets her just desserts in the end. Well, Joan, knowing how much Barbara Stanwyck likes Lux, I'm sure she brought several cakes along. Lux is my favorite soap, too, Mr. Carpenter, for my complexion and in my bath. Most screen stars feel that way about Lux, Joan. They believe there's nothing more refreshing than a Lux bath. It's a great pick-me-up after a strenuous day. It certainly is, Mr. Carpenter. Well, thank you, Joan, and I'll be looking forward to seeing you in a dramatic role soon. Use the generous bath size Lux. We think you'll like its creamy lather and pleasant fragrance as much as nine out of ten Hollywood screen stars do. We pause now for station identification. This is the CBS Radio Network. Curtain rises on Act Three of I Confess, starring Cary Grant as Father Michael Logan and Phyllis Thaxter as Ruth. It's very early the following morning, but already the phone has rung in the ground for home. An urgent call from Mr. Robertson, the prosecutor. And now Ruth has rushed to the church of Saint Marie. But I can't talk to you now, Ruth. There are people waiting at the confessionals. Mr. Robertson, phone. They're going to arrest you. Oh, Michael, what can we do? I don't know. You're not going to let them bring you to trial. Don't you know what that would mean? I've done this to you. I've done it all. No, no, you mustn't say that. They're going to call me as a witness, and all because of what I told them last night. They claim I've given them the motive they've been waiting for. Ruth, please, I must go now. I should have lied, but I told the truth. And now they'll twist everything I've said. They'll turn it, they'll use it. I wanted to help you, to help you. Well, it doesn't matter. There's nothing either of us can do. What a local. Keller? What is it? I, I can talk to you now. You are through with confessions? Yes. You have been talking to the police. They asked about me. You told them about me? I'm going to be arrested, Keller. You? You are trying to frighten me. You think by telling me that I will give myself up. So what are you going to do when they arrest you? I don't know. Uh, you are frightened. Maybe they will hang you instead of me and that frightens you. But you can't tell them, can you? You can't tell them as long as you are a priest. Come in. Father Logan. You've been looking for me, Inspector LaRue? Yes, Father, yes, indeed we've been looking for you. For about three hours we've been looking for you, every policeman in Quebec. I've been walking, I've been trying to think. You can call it off, Murphy, you just walked in. You had lunch yet, Father? No. Well, let me order something for you. Oh, uh, you're under arrest. Yes, I know. Priest arrested for murder. Father Logan charged with Valette murder. Robertson plans speedy trial of accused priest. So, if you will tell the court once again, Sergeant Murphy... Where did you find this priestly garment, this cassock? 
The rectory, sir. Father Logan's room. I found it hidden in his trunk. Hidden? Objection, my lord. On what grounds can the witness claim the article was hidden? Sustained. Sorry, my lord. The Crown is content to establish only the fact that the cassock was in the accused trunk. Now then, Sergeant, what did the police do with this cassock? We sent it to Dr. Bernard, pathologist at Laval University. I have his signed report here, sir. It's Dr. Bernard's opinion that the cassock was stained with human blood. Whose blood? The report says that the blood type is identical to that of the murdered man, Vallette. Thank you. Uh, If it please the court, the Crown would like to recall the witness whom we heard yesterday, but very briefly. Will Otto Keller take the stand? Now then, Mr. Keller, you told us yesterday that you spoke with Father Logan on the night of the murder at approximately 11.45 o'clock. Yes, sir. Under what circumstances? My wife was asleep, sir. I was just about to go to bed, so I opened the window. I saw someone entering the church. Who? I could not tell at that distance, sir, so I went downstairs and walked out of the rectory and across to the church. I saw someone kneeling against the altar rail. As he lifted his head, I saw it was Father Logan, sir. Was there anything about his manner that seemed out of the ordinary? He seemed so distressed, sir. I asked him if he were ill. He said no. He said I should go back and leave him alone. Did you go back? No, sir. Father Logan had always been so very kind to my wife and to me. I wanted to help him if I could. Well? He told me again to leave him alone, so I went back to our room. Your witness, Mr. Crawley. The defense waves examination at this time, my lord. Waves examination. Then the Crown calls Madame Granfor to the stand. Madame Ruth Granfor, please. I can't answer your questions in any other way. How can I when you repeatedly twist my words around and rephrase them? The witness will kindly confine herself to answer as to the facts. Madame Granfor, you just told us you were in love with the accused prior to the war. Yes. But what we are trying to find out is whether or not you were still in love with the accused on that night of Villette's murder. Yes, yes. Thank you. And how often had you met with him between the night at the summer house on the island and the night Villette was killed? Never, never. You want this court to believe that a woman in love doesn't make some attempt to I meet her lover? My lord, this line of questioning doesn't seem particularly relevant. But it is, my lord. I am trying to discover whether or not Villette's blackmail was based on his knowledge not merely of a single meeting between the accused and the witness, but of a continuous, uninterrupted no, series of... No, that's not of... true! It's not true! My lord, the witness appears to be on the verge of hysteria. May I excuse her for the moment and call the accused? Does the defense object? No objections, my lord. Call the accused. Father Michael Lowe. Suppose we begin with the cassock, Father Logan. This is your cassock. No, sir. It is not mine. Then perhaps you borrowed it from someone? No. Yet it was found in your trunk. Someone must have put it there? Yes. Or can you help us by suggesting who? I can't say. Father Logan, when did you decide to become a priest? After the war. And in becoming a priest, were you perhaps trying to hide from something? I've never thought of the priesthood as offering a hiding place. It involves certain responsibilities, certain morality. Yes. And yet you saw nothing wrong in having a clandestine meeting with a woman. Are you trying to imply that I was a priest at that time? I was not a priest. Did you consider that this woman was married? I I wasn't aware that she was. And so you spent the whole day with her. Yes. Yes, we were good friends. I hadn't seen her in over three years. Such good friends that you made no effort to go home that night? We were caught in a storm. Oh, then the storm was the villain. I saw nothing wrong in being caught in a storm. Nothing wrong. Then why, on the following morning, did you hit Villette with your fist? Were you anxious to protect Madame's reputation? Yes. Oh, then her reputation was endangered. You suddenly realized there was something more than merely being caught in the storm. Villette... Villette made insinuations. My argument with Villette had nothing to do with any sudden realization. But you hit him in anger. Yes. 
You hit a man when he merely intruded upon a harmless situation. Then surely you are capable of far more violence when that same man blackmails your friend, Madame Gromfort. I am not capable of murder. You would go to such a man, and unable to control your temper, unable to face a public scandal, you would turn again to physical force. No, I would not. No, you would not. You say that you and Madame separated at 11 o'clock on the night of the murder. That's right, yes. Then it was possible for you to be at Villette's house by half past 11. Yes, it was possible, but I did not go there. I went back to the rectory. And what did you do, Father Logan? I, I went up to my room. Then I went downstairs and into the church. Did you see anyone there? Otto Keller. Mr. Keller has told the court that the time then was 11.45 or after. That isn't true. Then perhaps you are prepared to tell us the truth. I have told you the truth. That is all you have to say. That is all. And I say that you did not return to the rectory until 11.45 or after. That you had met with Villette, that he threatened you with exposure, and that you then proceeded to kill him. No! No! <laughs> Prosecution rest case. Defense blast circumstantial evidence. Judge charges jury. Church withholds all comment. Verdict awaited. Priest to hang if guilty. Silence. Silence. Everybody stands. Gentlemen of the jury, are you agreed on your verdict? We are. Is Michael Logan guilty of murder or not guilty? While we attach grave suspicions to the accused, we cannot find sufficient evidence to prove that he actually killed Monsieur Villette. Our verdict is not guilty. Oh. Silence! Silence! Michael Logan, while I have no doubt, as judge of this trial, that the jury reached their conclusions in utmost regard for justice, I must express my personal disagreement with their verdict. Michael Logan, you are hereby discharged, and this court is adjourned. Well, Laro, I told you the cassock wouldn't be enough. They've ruined him. Why couldn't they just have said not guilty and let it go at that? Are you satisfied, Willie? Are you satisfied with all this? Do you think I enjoyed it, Pierre? Someday, perhaps, you and Ruth may forgive me. Ruth? Pierre, look. Here out the window. What are they doing to him? People are angry, madame. If he were anyone else They're but a priest... They're throwing things at him. They're hurting him. The police will handle it. There, you see? I can't even help him now. And after all I've done to him... LaRue, look. Isn't that Mrs. Keller out there? What's she doing? Yes. She's shouting something. She's pointing to her husband and shouting, I'd better get down there. Those were shots. Mrs. Keller. Someone shot Mrs. Keller. What is it, Murphy? What happened? She was running toward me, Mrs. Keller. She kept shouting, he's innocent. The priest is innocent. Keller was about 20 feet in back of her. He shot her twice. Where is she? They've just taken her to that chap over there. Who's getting a statement? No one, sir. She's dead. And Keller? He won't get far. We're after him now. He ran into the hotel down there. I don't want him shot. Well, he's still got the gun, sir. I don't want him dead. I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. Where's Father Logan? He went in the shop where Mrs. Keller is. Well, Father? All she was able to say was, forgive me. We, we should have Keller in a few minutes. Now, what about him? Well, uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Why did he shoot his wife? Why did she say you were innocent? I can't answer that. Keller worked in the rectory. He also worked as Villette's gardener. What else can you tell me about him? Well, will you let me try to talk to him? I've got to catch him first. All right, Father, come along. He's somewhere in the hotel. Thank you. What are you trying to do, Father? Protect him? I, I think we'd better go to the hotel. <laughs> Got him cornered, Inspector. Behind those doors is a ballroom. No place to hide. Just the floor and a stage. Every exit's covered. All right, all 
I just sent Farouche for tear gas. Oh, no, please. Let me try to talk to him. No. Murphy, open the doors. Now, the rest of you, stand back. Ready? Go ahead. Keller? What do you want? I want you to give yourself up. Why would I do that? You shot your wife. Isn't that enough? And what about Villette? Villette? So the priest talked. Logan, where are you, Father Logan? Keller. Ah, so you are there. How kindly you hear my confession, and then a little shame, a little violence. That's all it takes to make you talk. I'm going in there. Now get back, Father, I'll kill you. Oh, you show yourself the hypocrite, the pretender. I thought you would rather die than to betray your faith. Keep him covered, Murphy. Yes, sir. Now get ready. Aim for Keller's shoulder, make him drop the gun. Be easier to hit his leg, sir. Shoulder, the right shoulder. Run a shoot now, Keller. Drop your gun and we shoot. Oh, no, please. Don't make them do it, Keller. That is all you have to tell me. Oh. 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 Drop your gun, Otto. There's been enough bloodshed. You must not come closer, Father. I'll shoot you, you know. You won't shoot me, Otto. Why will I not shoot you? Because you call me Otto in such a friendly way, like Alma used to call me Otto. Where is my Alma? She's dead. No. You killed her. It is your fault. Oh, I loved her. It made me cry to see her work so hard. Her poor hands. Her poor, beautiful hands. She can't be dead. She is. And I... I am as alone as you are. Oh, no. I'm not alone. Yes, you are. To kill you now would be a favor to you. You have no friends. What has happened to your friends, our huh, Father? They mob you. They spit at you. It would be better if you were as guilty as I. Then they would shoot you quickly. Look. Three bullets. For you, Father. For you. Oh. 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 Help me, Father. Help me. Quickly, help. Get a doctor, the hotel doctor. Father. Stand back, please, all of you. Forgive me. Forgive me. My head. Hold my head. Yes, Otto. Pray for me. Ego te absolvo. In nomine Patris. Et fili. Et spiritus sancti. Amen. It's all over. Yes. I want you to know I, I'm going home with my husband. In a moment, our stars will return. Now here's Hollywood's recommendation for sunshine the year round, Mr. Art Linkletter. Thank you, Ken. And ladies, are you proud to show off your linen closet? You know, a well-kept linen closet is one mark of a good housekeeper. And of course, it's important to have your towels and sheets and all your linens smell just as clean and fresh as they look. And when you wash them with surf, you know they're clean clear through because they smell clean. There's no need to worry about unpleasant odors like stale, sour soap or the almost medicinal odor left by some detergents. You like the clean, sunshine freshness of your surf-washed linens. Mmm, when you wash them with surf, they smell like sunshine. And that's true no matter where you dry them, indoors or out, on damp days or dry ones. All-purpose surf is the safe white detergent for your linens and for everything you wash. And when you wash them with surf, they smell like sunshine. Now, Mr. Cummings with our stars. And we call them forward for a curtain call. Cary Grant and Phyllis Thackeray. <laughs> Cary, I certainly enjoyed your work in a dramatic part. Hmm. I think people are inclined to forget what a fine dramatic actor Cary is. Well, of course, of course. Well, it was nothing. I just play anything at all. Anything from comedy to opera. <laughs> bang, bang. You sing opera, Cary? Well, of course, I used to be in those romantic musicals, you know, where everybody raises a stein to dear old USC. <laughs> I even had a solo. Oh, you did? What did you sing? Um, High Barmaid. <laughs> well, I was a hay barmaid. Why don't you combine your talents and sing comic opera? Remember the beggar's opera? 
Oh, yes. Lawrence Olivia just uh, made the famous old comic opera into a motion picture in England for Warner uh, Brothers. He's pretty versatile, too. Yeah, I think I'll leave singing in Shakespeare to Sir Lawrence, and I'll just stick to drama and comedy. <laughs> Very wise, Carrie. I believe in staying with whatever you are, have confidence in. You said it. <laughs> That's why I've always been a devoted fan to Lux Toilet Soap. It certainly is a dependable complexion, Ken. Yeah, we can always depend on the Lux Radio Theater for the best in motion pictures. So, uh, what's for next week, Irving? It's not only one of 20th Century Fox finest pictures but it tells the story of some of our most exciting American history. It's the great love story of Rachel and Andrew Jackson in The President's Lady. And as our stars, we'll have dynamic Charlton Heston recreating his original role. And as his co-star, lovely and talented, Joan Fontaine. Oh, that will be a wonderful show. Good night. Good night. Good night. And see you soon. Good morning, honey. When you say good morning, does your breath say... Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. Morning, Molly. It won't if you use Chlorident toothpaste. Chlorident absolutely gets rid of that stale, furry taste that's a sure sign of bad breath. Some toothpaste only mask bad breath temporarily. But with Chlorident, that wonderful, clean, fresh feeling tells you your breath is sweet, even hours later. Chlorident hasn't got a little dab of chlorophyll. It's loaded with it. And it's got a patented polishing agent that cleans better than any other toothpaste formula bar none. A great university proved it. Anti-enzyme? Certainly. One brushing stops dangerous acid formations that cause decay for nine out of ten people for hour after hour after hour. So to get rid of morning mouth, get Chlorident. Then when you say good morning, your breath says clean. And fresh. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Charlton Heston and Joan Fontaine in The President's Lady. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Jack Crucian as LaRue, Leonard Pan as Keller, Edgar Barrier as Robertson, Chet Mencken as Murphy, George Baxter as Pierre, Ann Morrison as Alma, Charlie Long as Villette, Jill Oppenheim as Augustine, Bill Johnstone as the defense attorney, and Herb Butterfield, Tony Michaels, and Eddie Marr. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was composed and directed by Rudy Schrager. Well, Francis, why that big smile? Well, I just sort of found $10. What do you mean, sort of? Well, I did some figuring, Ken, and came out $10 a head. Oh, great. How'd you do that? Well, it's like this. I buy about 15 pairs of nylons a year. I spend, oh, a dollar and a quarter to a dollar thirty-five a pair. Mm -hmm. Say, $20 a year for stockings. Now, like any smart gal, I give my sheer nylons Lux Flakes care and... And get double the stocking wear. Hmm? So I cut stocking costs in half and save $10 a year. Now, isn't that money found? You bet it is, Francis. And any woman can do it just by giving her delicate nylons gentle Lux Flakes care. So don't wash your nylons harshly in wash day products. You see, Lux Flakes keep nylon threads strong and elastic so they're less likely to break and cause runs. That's why 96% of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux Flakes. And Lux Flakes are guaranteed safe by Lever Brothers. Remember, if you want double your stocking wear, be sure to use Lux Flakes Care. Lever Brothers Company unconditionally guarantees the quality and performance of Lux Toilet Soap, Lux Flakes, Chlorident Toothpaste, and Surf, or your money refunded. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The President's Lady, starring Charlton Heston and Joan Fontaine. Every Thursday evening, Lieber Brothers Company brings you the Lux Video Theater. Consult your local newspaper for time and station. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>